the first one uh, is for Alex, but anybody could chime in here. What are some common misconceptions that you've heard about rent subsidy? Um, I'm not sure if I have an answer to that. So if somebody else wants to take it, that would be great. That's okay. Uh, it, it's it's a little bit of a tough question without further clarification. So yeah. misconceptions about like what uh, party rent subsidies, like um, or like um, like whether it's effective or not, or whether it's it can you know if you've heard you know something about it being you know akin to a government handout or and some rationalizations about that um that it's not actually very effective um yeah. Oh, I'd have to pass that off to one of the sure. uh, yeah, panelists. And we can pass by that one if, if nobody has anything. I just, I wanted to touch on that one in case, because that rent rent control and rent subsidy, well, rent subsidy did come up. And, and I know that there are some, some misconceptions about how it works. Um, so yeah, feel free to chime in if, if anybody has anything on that one. <clears throat> Uh, the next question we can move to is, um, can, this is from Leo. They say, I love the concept of standardized building upgrade packages. Can you talk about how you balance the net cost of electrification with, oops, with the net savings of energy efficiency? Tariff on bill financing works when the operational savings pay back the capital investment, but electrification can be pricey. Do you want to take a crack at that, Gigi? I can also just say that that is a valid point around um, energy prices and what that ultimately means. And I think part of what the CPUC has been trying to do with the legislature is make a case for uh, which of the IOU proposals that were submitted as part of the clean energy finance proceedings this summer, which, uh, which programs actually deserve pilot funding. And I think a big reason why is because in California, we do, we do need to test whether or not uh, tariff on bill is going to be an equitable solution, not just for building owners, but for tenants. But that is a good point. Like just depending on where you are and what your energy prices are, um, you know, you could see, and this is another reason why I think tariff on bill is interesting because it's the utility taking on the risk that a building owner would normally take if they were going out and getting a loan for a deep rehab or a retrofit. But I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Gigi. Um, yeah, I can add. I mean, for our pilots, we are demonstrating emerging pre-commercial technology. Um, and they're not cost competitive right now. But a big part of our work is working with manufacturers to identify strategies for cost compression. So the pilots themselves were tracking time and cost very in a very granular way and making suggestions to improve products, identifying contractor issues, just really trying to streamline the technologies themselves and the that interaction with contractors um, to achieve cost compression. So, you know, that's a part of the research. We're still gonna see how those technologies perform and hopefully have good data around that and um, yeah, work directly with the manufacturers if uh, at least for scale and try to um, have those fit into the on-bill uh, financing options that we're looking at, so. And to, to be piggyback on that topic, Scott asks, can you go into more detail about how tariffed on-bill financing works from the utility perspective? I can provide some, I mean, it would be, I think that the, and, and I can provide a link for this afterwards too, because there were various proposals that were all submitted, but the idea is essentially you'd have um, what would be uh, a larger version of one of these programs that's tied to the meter so that the building decarbonization work that has already been done kind of in pockets, the utility incentive programs would just be scaled up. Um, in a way so that, again, the savings have to be enough to cover the cost of the investment. So um, that's part of why I think, again, going back to this pilot period where the CPUC is trying to pick which programs um, deserve pilot funding is important because I think after the research findings come back from that pilot period, we'll have a better idea of 
which of those IOU proposals um, is going to make sense, knowing that also they're in different parts of the state. But I don't know, Gigi, if there's um, because because that because it's really tough to speculate without seeing who's going to get funded right now, and actually seeing how the programs look in the real world, real world as opposed to how they look in agency proceedings when they're being presented by utility staff. Thank you, Nick and, and Gigi for for addressing that. There, there's a lot of questions about tariff on bill financing. Actually, uh, Jeffrey is is asking. Is there data on how many low-income households would be ineligible for inclusive utility investments because of projected lack of energy savings? Um, and two, is any other financing strategies available to support this demographic? So I guess to the first one, I don't have any data off the top of my head. And can you repeat the second one? Because we'd have to follow up on that first one. Yeah, yeah. Financing strategies to support this demographic. So deed restricted, like what we're talking about, yeah? I think so. Yeah, so, I mean, and I mentioned this during the presentation, but if you look at our pilot demonstrations um, across the state, uh, they're all leveraging multiple incentives. So um, some of them, so for example, our Southern California project has tech funding, it's got SoCal REN funding, it's might have SOMA, SOMA funding. I, I'm not sure what the latest update is on that. But um, And then we're taking the CEC funding um, and DOE funding to pay for other components of the program. So there are multiple funding streams in terms of building decarb uh, subsidies that are going into each pilot. And that's part of the reason why um, we're making the case or trying to make the case to the legislature at least that uh, there needs to be a statewide comprehensive program for multifamily deed restricted, but um, you could just as easily, I think, make the larger case that, and I think other folks have done that or the panelists throughout the day around the need to also look at NOAA properties um, and the larger uh, multifamily or rental housing space. But yeah, there, there's several programs. And uh, I would say that a good portion of the first uh, initial months and sometimes even longer than that with building owners is this assessment period where we're trying to figure out how to make financing work in alignment with, with what is usually already a larger maintenance project that they're undertaking on site. And I'll just add to that um, AEA, a large part of AEA's day-to-day -day work is working with building owners, understanding the funding stack that's available for whole building retrofits. So that's, um, that we, we came to the pilot projects with that and um, the technologies that I mentioned that are emerging are expensive as they are um, and what makes them affordable right now is that CEC funding so I think we're just trying we're trying to work on cost compression with the typical incentive funding stack without that emerging technology research fund so that's kind of what we what we know most owners are familiar with or do for their projects so that's that's where we're that's where we're working towards trying to get the packages cost effective in that way so thank you we'll move to another question from elise they say i i heard some concern from an apartment project manager about some sort of delay with getting pg &E approval or final inspection something like that for upgraded uh, electrical at a big apartment complex here that needs to do upgrades. Is this an issue anyone has heard of? He doesn't expect to be able to uh, have a final mechanical permit for a year. Has anybody come across this? So is this a, an entitlement question directly related to just what would be uh, an electrification upgrade on the property, or is there like emerging technology in, in that property that this person's referencing? Because there are occasionally issues when you work with jurisdictions around emerging technology that we install, where we um, from time to time will have to go to the funder, like the Energy Commission, and ask for them to provide documentation, um, clearly stating that this is not a, a product that's commercially available, and that because it's used for research purposes, um, they, they're sometimes willing to um, really just let us install that product knowing that it doesn't meet you know, whatever the current uh, specs are because we're testing it for research purposes. But the other question around just if you're having issues around entitlements, like 
I guess that's going to be project to project and region to region because some of our projects are easier to entitle than others. But um, yeah, I hope that gets to it. DJ, is there anything um, that you'd want to add around entitlements now or permitting? The person just added, they were adding washer dryers that needed upgrading, um, upgrading of the electrical, and it sounded like pg &E was the holdup. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not surprised by that. There are typical, they they often delay electrification projects, especially if um, it depends if the service is being upgraded. Um, so that I know for PV projects, in my experience, that can be delayed months to years. So I'm not surprised, but I don't have anything more to yeah. add. Yeah. Okay. So switch, switching gears um, more towards um, I think Rich and, and Agni, um, this person says, asks, are there examples of energy efficiency programs successfully mandating that rents can't be increased on properties that receive upgrades? Or do these protections need to come from the local jurisdictions? Um, I can start with some thoughts and I, you know, admittedly don't know everything. And I think we're all learning about a lot of the nuances involved in some of like how existing regulations or laws might be applied or or not to our interest in electrification projects. But I do think it's more of a local jurisdictional issue. Um, I'm personally not aware of, of any programs that have prohibited um, rent, direct rent increases for participating in an energy program. I don't know if others on the panel have anything to add. Yeah, my understanding was that it was a local jurisdiction issue as well. I don't know, though, for affordable, deed restricted affordable housing, can it be? done at the state level, that's a question for an affordable housing developer. But my understanding is that it is local, which is why we're pushing for the city and county to do that at the local level. Yeah, and I have heard, um, I think this was a question earlier, like incentive programs like SOMA, for instance, which is solar on multifamily affordable housing, does have a requirement um, for tenant benefits. And I think often I I don't I don't remember how it's enforced directly, but I think if it's proven that there aren't tenant benefits, then they would rescind the incentive. So I've seen that in some uh, solar efficiency programs. I think LIWIP has similar language, but I'm not sure if it has the same um, teeth. If it has the yeah. Thank you all. Um, our, our next question is is for Rich. Um, San Francisco's bond measures to fund building earthquake retrofits included language to limit pass-throughs of costs to tenants. Were those clauses successful? And and perhaps um, you know others here know other models here, other models in the in the state. Um, so were they successful? And what was the second part of that question? Hold on, I just lost it. If there are any other examples that are similar out there? Is, there, is this something that San Francisco is looking at for future bond measures to fund climate action? So thanks to whoever sent that question in, I, I did have a mental note to, to mention um, something about and it was an example in the Shoot Mahali Weinberger memo about um, a mandatory soft story retrofit ordinance that was passed in San Francisco a number of years ago um, that basically required um, a phased approach for owners of soft story buildings, which are a lot of residential mixed use buildings with sort of an open wood framed ground floor that would be very susceptible to collapse um, if and when the next big earthquake comes. So there was a, a a retrofit upgrade requirement put on landlords, and then a lot of you know thought and discussion and engagement went into um, costs and um, how landlords could um, pay for these improvements and what um, mechanisms they had to 
recover costs. Um, my, I actually, that was my, my note was to that I needed to go back to the folks that ran that program to get more information and data about their experience with that. Um, so the short answer is I don't know if it was successful or not, uh, but it's on my to-do list to go to that agency that administered that program to, to you know, kind of see if they had data to share that could inform how we might approach this from a building decarbonization perspective. Thank you. Does anybody else have experience from elsewhere in the state um, about, about that kind of mechanism? The person later added, uh, if, if speakers have uh, thoughts on any other future San, San Francisco climate funding and efforts, bonds or otherwise, I mean, we are in the process of figuring out financing streams for doing large scale decarbonization in San Francisco, whether it's a bond or I think the various uh, options are still being developed. Some of us are involved in that working group as well, including myself. Uh, so yes, Laura, um, I, would, I would definitely push for some of that to address, you know, uh, the, the tenant issue and costs. Um, but it's still very nascent. Uh, it's really not crystallized yet. Thank you, Avni. And I could just add something that's tangential to this here, um, because I know we're all in this space where we're trying to figure out whether stable funding, largely for like residential um, building decarb, but a lot of the decarbonization folks are likely to see in the next couple of years in their communities is actually going to be happening in places like school districts. So for folks that are in either, I would say K through 12 or all the way up to K through 14, um, in the recent budget, we had almost $4 billion spread out to 2024 for school facility aid modernization. And that's gonna also include schools being eligible for these community resilience centers. And of course, CalShape, which is like the heat pump or HVAC program that got some funding uh, for schools. But there's, uh, when, when, when folks said bonds, it just kind of triggered to me that a lot of the uh, local measures that we have oftentimes for buildings uh, and education aside from the dedicated funding from the state does uh, for schools does come in that way. But um, that's something to think about, especially in the community resilience centers, because there's flexibility there around um, what can be done to convert those buildings um, to areas that are essentially community uh, gathering places during climate emergencies. Thank you, Nick. Our next question is from Jeffrey uh, saying, thank you, Nick and Gigi for that clarification earlier. So, so for low income affordable housing, deed restricted or unregulated, what I'm hearing, he says, is that it still relies on braiding public funding from state and federal sources. Are there no other programs like block power that leverage private capital markets? Given the massive scale needed to achieve holistic electrification, I'm not convinced we can rely 100% on public funding. So that's not directed towards anybody in particular, but if anybody has anything to say about that one. I can take a, my crack at it, which is to say that uh, we learned uh, in the energy efficiency years, right, in the last decade that uh, deed restricted affordable housing properties are such complex financial entities that adding any layer of debt or financing to it was, was just not palatable to the owners uh, or the managers of the property. So that's why a lot of the, the, the financing offerings that were created, um, even at 0% financing, were not, they, they did not have enough uptake with owners because it's just, it, it's just very complicated. So I, I don't know if that has been resolved or how it can be, but I know that's a major issue to, you know, for owners to take up financing to, to finance this stuff. Another similar question actually um, is from Walker. Could someone explain why a tariff-based on-bill financing is preferable to a loan that is repaid to the utility bill? It seems like the tariff approach could lead the property owner to pay more than the cost of the upgrades. So again, I guess I could take a quick 
crack at this, but in a lot of the, and Afni just did a good job of mentioning that um, the, the, the financing options right now for building owners, and I would even go by extension and say, if you're um, just trying to access uh, capital to pay for these building DCAR programs over time, it, it's, it's just not an easy thing to do. But I think the, 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 the premise of Tariff Donville, what makes it special is that the, uh, the cost of the improvements um, have to be covered by the savings. And I, and I think until we actually can see what that looks like in California, um, it's difficult to say whether or not, uh, and, and, and then I would also say that it's utility investment, not alone. So that, that's also important because utilities are already making some of these investments through different programs. So this is just trying to really scale up that investment, but I, I, I hear where the concern is there. And again, I would go back to, we need to see what a pilot looks like first before, um, before I think we go back to trying to figure out what a loan, loans could look like. Because we already have gap loan financing for programs like SOMA, which is problematic in terms of participation too. So um, the idea I think is that tariff on bill is preferable because it's, an, it's a utility investment that just kind of is more in alignment with what they're already doing instead of trying to ask the market to uh, underwrite these savings. Rich, I saw you heartily agreeing with some of the things that Nick was saying. Did you want to add anything to that? Other than heartily agreeing to, to what Nick was saying, but I, I just think one of the key things is that when you're talking about loans, it requires, um, you know, it, it's a credit check on on the individual. Are they credit worthy to accept a loan? Is it a secured loan or is it an unsecured loan? And the, you know, associated penalties for not payment, non-payment are, um, I think, out of line with, you know, sort of the the scale and size and, and type of projects that we're actually thinking about here. Um, so the risks are very high for the borrower, whereas if it's, as Nick was saying, it's a utility investment, tenants can benefit from these financing options, whereas, you know, typically tenants can't borrow money to make improvements as easily to um, building systems as um, as if you were an owner um, or very, very high credit uh, individual. So um, I think it makes the potential amount of financing and capital to deploy to these solutions uh, much more accessible. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, not related to on-bill financing, but the split incentive that was mentioned before is just a reality for a lot of these building owners who go out and try to find fa financing. A lot of um, like often you could take debt out or um, can refinance systems on the common meter or that are owner paid. But yeah, again, for, for apartment upgrades, it's hard to refinance. And I, we, we've been, um, for years, I've been just trying to come up with a model that can address that split incentive. So that's where we landed with the on bill financing. But if there are other options, I'd love to know what folks have found too. <laughs> Well, I think with that, we'll wrap up our Q&A. Thank you to all of the speakers who stuck around um, and for all of our participants that stayed with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate all your good questions and comments in the chat. I'm going to wrap us up here. As a reminder, we will be posting the slides at on the Bay Ren, uh, website. And uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email as well. And, oh, am I going the wrong direction? There we go. One last thing before you really dive into the rest of your day, if you could check your email and follow the, follow the link to our survey and um, tell us what you thought. And respondents will be entered to, to, uh, into a giveaway for a solar phone charger, so pretty cool. Um, and with that, we'll close things out. I really appreciate all of our guest speakers. Thank you so much for the time that you spent in preparing for the forum today. And thank you so much to our participants who, who stayed and entered all your good comments and questions. We really appreciate it. So we look forward to seeing you at the next forum or at another Bayren uh, training coming up this month or next. So thank you so much.